we're looking at innovations and markets. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, corporate strategies. So essentially what we want to do here is we want to look at how do companies grow um, and innovate and, and develop new markets. Okay, and so this is something called the Ansoff Matrix, um, and I'd like you to watch this video. And it basically talks about how you can um, how you can develop new products or develop new markets. And this is just, you know, um, on on the matrix here. This is this is new, new, current, current, right? So if you have uh, a current market, how do you develop a new market? If you have um, a current product in development, how do you diversify, etc. So these these are these are um, ways to, to develop a new market. And so please do watch this video and we will move on. All right, so corporations employ different strategies to introduce uh, products to market. And two key strategies are pioneering, which is being the first to market with a new innovation, and imitative, which is developing products that are similar to existing new products. So we're going to look at both of those strategies right now. So pioneering this is being first to market with a new innovation and this is actually a super interesting video it's the it's the history of running shoes and how um, Adidas uh, developed what we think of as the running shoe um, so please pause me watch this video and um, enjoy all right being pioneering means that you're being first to market for a new innovation and now this is risky right because and it's also costly it's risky because you don't really know if the market exists i mean you can do as much market research as you want but if there is no market for a product then no one's going to buy it and therefore it is not a good innovation there is however potential for the largest gains if you are the first to market then you are going to be the the go-to people and you are likely to have the largest market share which means that you will be the most um, you'll, you'll make the most money you're going to need really strong research and development this is called r d um, and that can be very expensive because research is expensive because you need to employ people who are um, not cheap actually you know because these people are professionals and you have to pay them a lot and they need to do a lot of research uh, product research market research and that's expensive and as I just said you need really good market research um, to know that your product is actually something that is viable within the market um, companies do not know how introducing um, a totally new unknown and unexpected product or service in the market will go so this is really important to understand you just don't know you know, it could be a, a, a wild success or it could be a total flop. And you need to have good market research and, the you know, really good ideas. And you can still have flops based on that. So it's something to definitely consider. All right, you can also have something called an imitative um, strategy. So this is when you develop products that are similar to existing products, right? And so, you know, um, Bose, for instance, was sort of like the first to market with these really high-end um, noise canceling, noise canceling headphones, um, and then you've got imitators, and and, and these guys, um, you know, imitate the the same idea here, and you know, it, a lot of it. This has to do with branding and things like that. You know, like Skull Candy and, and Beats are 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 you know, they're excellent headphones, but they they were not the first to market. Those were the uh, Bose headphones. So Bose captured the biggest market share. These guys came along later you know, instituting similar ideas um, and, and also made money with them, more, more through branding than anything. All right, now you want to also try to develop markets. So you're finding new applications for existing products, by um, thereby opening up new markets. And, you know, a good example for this is, is uh, duct tape, right? Like, you know, duct tape when it first came out was silver. That's what you had. And now you can get many different colors of, of duct tape. And, and so you are basically um, developing a new market based on existing markets. You know, maybe somebody wouldn't buy the silver duct tape, but they're happy to buy the orange one. So new products marketed to existing customers, new products marketed to new customers, same product marketed to, to new customers, or creating new applications for existing products. This is all um, a strategy of market development. And again, duct tape's an, a really good example of how, how that happened, where they, they developed this market by basically creating new applications for existing products. You can have product development. So this is the creation of new or modified or updated uh, products aimed at main, mainly at the company's existing um, customers. So you are developing a new product to sell to, to 
So, you know, post-its are, are an example of this. I mean, you get post-its in different colors, a bit like the duct tape, but also you can get post-its in different sizes. Now you can get them up to being quite big. You can get post-its that are sort of the size of like a A5 sheet of paper, probably even bigger. I mean, they I think they even have them for, for chart paper. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're you're using the post-it brand, the adhesive and paper and all that stuff, and you are building, um, you know, you're essentially marketing to the same customers, but more varieties of them. So, so it's adding variations to a product that builds on an established brand, adding new features. For instance, you might add a navigation system in a car. So, you know, you have your Toyota, um, whatever, the Prius, and now you, you have the Prius with a navigation system. You're increasing your product range or you release uh, many different types of a certain general product. And so, like I said, post-its are a good example of this because not only do they have different colors, but they also have different sizes and things like that. And, and generally what we're looking at is at existing customers. This, by the way, if you remember, we're, we're looking for basically trying to expand our market. So we're trying to appeal to new groups of people, to new markets, right? And again, this is different than, than what I showed you with the post-its because like for instance, duct tape here is what they're doing is they're saying, hey, like we're gonna ex ex expand our market by offering these different colors. These essentially don't expand the market. What they're doing is expanding um, the range of products to existing customers. Market penetration. So this is increasing sales to existing customers or finding new customers for an existing product. product. Okay, and this, this is based on a, a market penetration has something that's based on an equation, right? And so this uh, it's, it basically is product sales over total market potential. So if you have 65 million cell phone users and 300 million people in the country, then you have a 22% market penetration. And this means that the market um, could increase by 78% or 235 million people. So this is, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, an equation that works with this that, um, that helps you understand what your product's potential is and what the product sales are. And, you know, understanding is there an actual, um, is there growth that can happen within the market or do you need to develop a new market? Um, some of the ways that we can increase product penetration is through promotions, right? So, you know, um, that, that might be discounts. So you, you uh, offer discounts to people. Um, you have celebrity uh, endorsements. So, for instance, uh, you please watch this. This is a, an example of a celebrity endorsement where uh, George Clooney is, uh, is basically um, selling Nespresso. And then you have bonus offers. You, you get the two, two for, for, two for one kind of idea, right? So those are ways that you can increase your market, um, your sales. So increasing sales of existing customers to existing customers or finding new ones. You can diversify your product. So that means you're increasing sales from new products or markets. So you are basically widening your product line. Okay, so Nike's product line increased from just selling shoes to selling all kinds of different sporting goods, right? So originally Nike just sold shoes and now they sell all kinds of different things. And so that's increasing that's increasing the number of offerings you have from your brand. And so that's called product diversification. And lots of companies do this. Now, you can do a hybrid model, which means that you're using more than one of the strategies discussed earlier. So that could be product diversification, market penetration, um, product development, market development. Okay, so it, it would be using more than one of those strategies. Okay, you can maximize profits and sales. It provides a quick turnaround, uh, reduces R&D spending, especially if you're imitating somebody else's product. Like if you're, you know, if you're creating a, a soccer ball that already exists, then, you know, you are essentially, um, you know, you're not creating a new soccer ball. You are creating uh, just a, another, you know, like an imitator. Like same with these watches, this could be considered imitative, right? Because if you're, you know, copying, I don't know, an Apple watch or something like that, or, or uh, um one of the fitness trackers, uh, then you are, you're imitating that and, you know, but you're putting, you're diversifying your, your, your uh, product line. So that would be a hybrid model. You're an imitator and you're increasing your product line. Um, and it reduces the risk of employing only one or only a pioneering strategy, right? So remember pioneering strategies are risky in the sense that, that you're not ever entirely sure that what you are creating is going to actually succeed. 
Okay, we're going to talk about uh, another strategy, and this is uh, corporate social responsibility. So it's a form of self-regulation for a company that, that centers on the development of goals related to three areas. This is economic, social, and environment. So if you remember, that's basically the triple bottom line idea from earlier. And um, being, being a good corporation, so a responsible corporate citizen, has an appeal because you can actually um, use that to to um, increase your sales. This is a, a video that, that talks about that, so please pause me and go ahead and watch this video. But you know, this it can having a corporate, uh, being corporate, being socially responsible as a corporation um, can help increase your sales because people would want to buy from you more than than a company that is not socially responsible. And here's some examples. So this is. Um, these are called CSR, right? And it's shortened to corporate social responsibility. And here's 10 examples of corporate social responsibility. And um, this is very interesting if you ask me. So I'd like you to read through the, that link and make sure you understand it. I mean, it goes from everything with uh, Xerox. And Xerox has a, a community involvement program. So, you know, you can propose an idea to the company and then they will fund it. So, you know, anything from, um, you know, uh, community gardens to cleanups and things like that and and Xerox will fund these kinds of things um, Chipotle uh, basically what they're doing is they're making sure that they take food that is you know less than perfect that people don't want to buy necessarily um, and and basically um, making it so that it is more affordable so you are essentially um, taking food that is you know not quite perfect and selling it at a 30 dis 30 percent discount so people can afford it and um, that helps to reduce food waste. Tom Shoes, basically this, this company, if you buy a pair of shoes from them, they give a pair of shoes to a, another child. Um, Juntos does the same thing. Patagonia, they basically have a, um, you know, they, they want their company to be using uh, materials that are sourced well. So they're using organic co uh, cotton. They're using things like, I don't know that, that people did this, but apparently, um, some companies will, will use ducks that, that have their feathers picked while they're alive. So that's live pluck, uh, plucking. That sounds really terrible, and torturous. Um, so, you know, Patagonia is making sure that they're, they're ethically sourcing their, um, their products well. Uh, they work towards a living wage. So they make sure that the people who make their clothes actually have enough to live on. And they, they also make sure that they're using as much as possible renewable energy and green buildings. And, and this goes on, like Levi Strauss has a worker well-being, so they're trying to make sure that the, the workers that work for them are, are um, you know, happy and, and uh, have, a, have a nice life. Uh, New Skin, this is a, a, a company that, that makes um, skincare products. They donate some of the revenues to um, uh, help alleviate hunger around the world. Twitter does some stuff. Starbucks you know, basically wants to use fair trade um, coffee, and so people have paid a living wage. And, and Lego also works with uh, to um, put children's ideas and creations uh, to help inspire for the future. So those are examples of, of corporate social responsibility. It's what they're doing to help improve the lives of people that, that you know, this, the social lives of people, the economics of their com company, and improve the environment at the same time. So... This is uh, this is uh, the, an example of triple bottom line in action with with uh, corporations, and that's it. Thanks, guys.